I've done a fair bit of server content on this channel, but I realized I've talked a lot about RAID and some of you may not know what the different configurations are. Today, let's explore the common types of RAID, how they work, what are the pros and cons, and how to plan out your next configuration. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. For starters, what is RAID? Well, RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks, or inexpensive disks, depending on who you ask. It's a method of combining two or more hard drives into a single logical disk, often to improve performance or provide redundancy in case of disk failure. The drives I'll be using today are the two 240GB Seagate IronWolf 110 SSDs, as well as the four 14TB IronWolf NAS drives. All of these drives are SATA interface, but the concepts apply to SAS or NVMe disks as well with the right controller. Basically speaking, there are two different ways to configure RAID, one through hardware and one through software. Hardware RAID typically requires the use of a RAID card, like this Intel RMS 25 PB040, which supports up to eight disks natively. There are as many varieties of software RAID as there are operating systems, so today we'll be focusing on the ZFS file system and RAID Z for demonstration. With hardware RAID, your computer does not generally see the individual physical disks plugged in, and can only see the RAID volumes you create. Hardware RAID is typically configured on the card before your computer boots into BIOS. This allows you to configure your disks and tell the BIOS which RAID volume the system can boot from. One advantage to hardware RAID is it is less resource intensive on your system, as most of the work reading and writing is handled by the RAID card itself. It also tends to be faster than a lot of other solutions, especially when using RAID cards with large amounts of cache memory. Software RAID works just a little bit differently. It's configured inside your operating system and your OS is able to see each disk individually, plus the resulting RAID volumes you create. If you're only using a couple drives, you should be able to just connect the disks to your motherboard's onboard SATA controller and off you go. If you need larger arrays, you can use a host bus adapter, otherwise known as an HBA. Similar to a RAID card, an HBA typically has either SATA or SAS connections on board, which can break out to four ports each. The HBA I'm using today is the HP H220. It's a little bit older card, but you can snag one on Amazon for about $45. There are a huge number of consumer motherboards on the market which claim to support hardware RAID in the BIOS. However, the vast majority of the onboard systems are actually not hardware RAID. They emulate RAID through software. There's no performance increase and only a little bit of added redundancy. If you are configuring a home server and performance is one of your goals, do consider getting yourself either a RAID card or an HPA. However, if redundancy is your main goal, these configurations often work just fine. There are two main cable types for connecting disks up to HBA and RAID cards, both of which are referred to as mini SAS connections. The ports on the cards I have today are both mini SAS SFF8087 ports, which offer up to six gigabit speeds on four disks per SAS port you have. Using a breakout cable like this one, which connects your mini SAS port to up to four SATA or SAS disks at the same time, or connecting to a backplane allows each of these controllers to manage eight disks at once. There are also chassis out there, like the Inwin RS212, which use what's called an expansion backplane. That allows the two ports on this RAID card to manage all 12 disks in the server at the same time, rather than just the eight it's normally limited to. In theory, and with the right expansion method, this card could actually be used to control up to a thousand disks at the same time. However, make sure to check your RAID card's documentation to make sure that is a supported feature. Also be aware that you will still be limited to the bandwidth of these two ports. The other cable is called a mini SAS SFF8643. I know, it's a real intuitive name. Like the 8087, the cable supports up to four drives per port, but at 12 gigabit speeds instead of just six. At the moment, only high-end SAS drives are capable of this speed, but SAS controllers do support connecting SATA disks. However, you cannot plug a SAS drive into a SATA-only controller, so keep that in mind when selecting your RAID card or HBA. The cables are both backward and forward compatible. Both of my cards use 8087 ports, but the Inwin RS212 has 8643 ports on its backplane. Converting one port to the other is no problem at all with the right cable, but keep in mind you will only get the speed of your slowest interface. Now that you know how to connect your drives, it's time to get them set up in a RAID. We'll start with hardware RAID and its available configurations. The best way to plan your RAID configuration is determine beforehand what you want out of it and what the pros and cons of each RAID method are. The three main considerations are as follows. Speed, for either reads or writes. Redundancy, to keep your data safe in the event of a disk failure. And size, how much storage space you need in your RAID volumes. While there are methods of rating disks together with non-matching capacities, today we're only going to focus on match disk configurations. Also keep in mind that every RAID controller uses its own configuration method and will have its own GUI design. For instructions on how to use your exact RAID card, make sure to follow your card's instructions. Starting with configurations that only require two disks, we have RAID 0 and RAID 1. RAID 0 is what's known as a striped volume configuration. It's kind of like duct taping two disks together to get double the speed and double the capacity. 
In the case of our two Seagate Iron Wolf 110 240 gig SSDs, a RAID 0 volume would net us 480 gigabytes of capacity and two 6 gigabit connections, up to doubling your read and write speed, especially when it comes to random I.O. The downside of a RAID 0 is there is double the chance of failure as well, and if you lose one of your disks, well, you lose all of your data. This is by far the least safe RAID configuration, but remember, RAID is not a backup. It is, however, one of the fastest. I would recommend RAID 0 for highly intensive workloads where data security is not important, like cache or scratch disks. RAID 1 is also a two-disk configuration and is called a mirrored volume. Both drives in a RAID 1 are exact copies of one another. The Seagate 240GB SS drives in a RAID 1 would have a 240GB capacity. And because there are now two sources to read from, read speeds are effectively doubled. If a disk fails in a RAID 1 volume, the other disk still contains all of the data from that volume. Simply replace the failed disk and the RAID will rebuild itself. The downside to RAID 1 is write speed. As data needs to be written to both disks simultaneously and then verified by the RAID controller, there is typically a steep penalty involved. This can be mitigated with a large cache on the RAID controller, where data is written to cache first and then transferred over to a RAID volume. I typically recommend RAID 1 for server disks or volumes where you would feel better having a little bit of redundancy. But remember, RAID is not a backup. One neat thing you can do with RAID 1 volumes is combine them together to create a mega RAID of sorts, I guess. Sorry, that was stupid. In this case, called a RAID 10 volume. This configuration requires at least four matching disks. First, set up two RAID 1 volumes and then RAID 0 them together. The advantage of the setup is it doubles your speed and capacity of your RAID 1 volume, making four Iron Wolf 240 gig drives have a 480 gigabyte capacity. You also allow up to two disks to fail in the array and still maintain your data. I say up to two because you cannot lose two drives on the same side of a RAID 0. That's the same as losing one drive in a RAID 0 and all your data disappears. Remember, RAID is not a backup. Next up, we're gonna get into some more open-ended RAID configurations, starting with RAID 5. It requires at least three disks, but honestly can be configured with as many as you want. I don't, however, recommend running more than four disks in a RAID 5, and we'll get into why in just a second. The advantage to RAID 5 is definitely the capacity to the number of disks that you have to use. You get the full capacity of all the disks in your RAID volume, minus one. This means with three 14 terabyte Iron Wolf NAS disks, you'd have a capacity of 28 terabytes. Four disks would get you 42 terabytes. One disk can also fail in the array and all of your data will be maintained. RAID 5 is up to twice as fast in reads as a single disk, but suffers from a similar write penalty to RAID 1. RAID 5 uses what's called block level striping and distributed parity. That's a really fancy way of saying that when you write data to a RAID 5 volume, the data is written to two disks at once and evenly distributed to every disk in the array. There are a number of people who recommend against using RAID 5 for large capacity arrays, as the time to rebuild an array can stretch into days. In that time, if another disk fails, you will lose all your data in the array. I have seen this happen personally, but it is exceedingly rare. But again, repeat after me, RAID is not a backup. Did you say it? The RAID configuration I've been recommending most over the last couple years, and in fact have moved my FreeNAS server over to, is RAID 6. It works very similar to a RAID 5 setup, but requires at least four drives instead of just three. But it comes with the safety net of having two disks fail instead of just one. But remember, RAID is not a backup. The capacity of a RAID 6 is the full array minus two drives, so a four drive array of our 14 terabyte Iron Wolves would net us 28 terabytes in total. However, the sweet spot is when you hit six disks or more. Six 14 terabyte drives in a RAID 6 gives you 56 terabytes of usable space. Eight gives you 84. It's just about the best of every world when it comes to RAID. In a four drive configuration, there's even more data security than a RAID 10, as any two disks can fail in a RAID 6 and you will still be okay. But remember, RAID is not a backup. The array is also expandable well beyond four disks as well. There are bigger capacity hits to this configuration, but if large capacity and safe storage is your goal, this is by far my favorite configuration. You can also stripe together a RAID 5 or a RAID 6 array into a RAID 50 or RAID 60. Same exact concept as a RAID 10. So that is hardware RAID in a nutshell. But what about software RAID? The RAID configurations I listed earlier are available through a number of onboard RAID controllers on your motherboards, as well as many OSs have software RAID configurations built in. A RAID 1 is still a RAID 1, whether it is software or hardware controlled. What will be different is the performance, depending on what you use to configure the array. In both my FreeNAS and Proxmox tutorial videos, I mentioned using ZFS, or the Z file system, when configuring drives on those servers. ZFS has its own RAID system based on the same principles of hardware RAID, and without the performance loss of software emulation. It does, however, require more out of your CPU, as RAID and parity operations are not handled by dedicated RAID hardware. 
RAID Z offers striped and mirrored setups along the same lines as RAID 0 and RAID 1. These come with the same advantages and disadvantages as hardware RAID, except for one. Without a hardware RAID controller, you typically don't get read and write cache on your HBA. Again, if your server is going to be performance-based, you may want to consider adding an SSD as a cache drive. FreeNAS is one operating system that can take advantage of cache drives to speed up data access, rather than waiting on your RAID Z to complete the operation. RAID 5 and RAID 6 also have equivalents in ZFS, and they're called RAID Z and RAID Z2. And I know what you're asking yourself right about now. You're saying, what is the biggest difference between hardware and software RAID? It sounds like they're pretty much the same thing, just with different names. And to some extent, you're kind of right. Hardware RAID cards can sometimes hold a performance advantage, especially in cards with large amounts of cache. The downside is configuration, as it either happens before an OS is booted or requires additional software and drivers in the OS to manage your arrays. Without visibility into the individual physical disks, your OS may not know a disk is failing, as the RAID will still appear whole even if a drive has died. There is no improving the performance of an emulated RAID from a consumer motherboard. However, software RAID from an operating system can be just as fast or faster than hardware RAID, especially if you can take advantage of an SSD cache disk. Software RAID allows the OS to see each individual disk and alert you to problems without special drivers or software installed. And software RAID is hardware agnostic. If a hardware RAID card fails, it can be difficult or sometimes impossible to recover the RAID without the exact model card to replace it. Migrating a RAID configuration can sometimes be done to another card, but it is far from a sure thing, as different model cards or even sometimes different firmware versions of the same card can prevent a successful recovery. Meanwhile, software RAID only needs the drives to be visible to the OS. It really doesn't care how that's handled on the back end. Here at home in my server rack, both my Proxmox and FreeNAS servers are set up using ZFS RAID. Proxmox with just a pair of mirrored 500 gig SSDs at the moment, and FreeNAS with a pair of 60 gig SSDs holding the OS, with six 6 terabyte HGST Helium drives in a RAID Z2 for storage. Quiz time to see if you were paying attention. How much usable space do I have with the 6 terabyte drives in a RAID Z2? So there you have it. I know this video is probably a little bit long-winded, but I hope you got something out of it. And I hope it helps you narrow down on which RAID configuration is right for you. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down below in the comments and I will try to answer them. Also, let me know if this video helped you understand RAID even just a little bit better, as that makes me feel a little bit better. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already, and follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing. And if you're interested in any of the hard drives I showed off today, make sure to follow the Amazon affiliate links down in the video description. Those really do help out the channel when you click on them. And that is going to do it for me in this video. Boy, this has been a long one. This took almost two hours to film. Uh, I do hope you guys enjoyed it. And as always, I will see you in the next one. Cheers, guys. doesn't finish well. And today's beer is sent in to us from Superfan Caveman over in Wisconsin. Uh, this is the Bells Brewery in Comstock, Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota or Michigan? Am I? Michigan, excuse me. The Bells Brewery in Comstock, Michigan. Uh, this is the Winter White Ale. It's a Belgian-inspired wheat ale and uh, 5%. Interesting. Interesting smell. Not a fan right off the bat, but uh, we'll see how it tastes. It's an ale, and the Belgian in it comes very late and lingers, and it's not, not overly pleasant, I will say. Uh, it's kind of a weird, sour uh, taste to it. Not really any banana or clove or, or nutmeg or some some of those rich Belgian style flavors. Um, it tastes like a Belgian style Pilsner. It's very clear. I'm sure someone would find this refreshing, but I was expecting a lot more Belgian in this, not uh, just a winter ale with a touch of Belgian. We'll see if I like it more as we go along. A couple of drinks in, that is a little bit better, I will say. It's still not great, but it's better. All right, I am completely through this beer after a very brief break. Um, honestly, it warmed up a little bit and it did get a little bit more pleasant. Um, it is still among the weakest Belgian-inspired wheat ales I've had. Like I said, it tasted very much like a Pilsner. It was, but it, was, but it wasn't crisp. It, it was this weird, muted, kind of thick flavor. And the Belgian notes that I'm typically used to tasting were just kind of there in the background and they weren't good Belgian notes. 
So decent beer. I don't know that I would drink one again, but it's a solid find if you're at a bar or a nice, nice summer beer. It's not offensive, but it's not great. And this video is taking so long, we're gonna have a bonus beer. Uh, this was also sent in by Caveman. This is a uh, New Glarus Brewing in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Belgian Red. So we're doing two uh, Belgian inspired, inspired beers today. That smells like cinnamon. Oh, that is weird. Lord, could they have chosen a smaller font? Some people paint, some sing, others write, I brew. Cherries, Wisconsin farmed wheat, and Belgian roasted barley. It's a Belgian style red that they added cherries to. And the only thing to give you that indication is they put cherries on the, the label. I didn't know cherries belonged in a Belgian or a red. Very, very sweet smelling. Now that it's out of the bottle, um, there's a little bit of spice that I was interpreting as cinnamon. It's definitely not cinnamon, but it's very pie-like. Nope, never mind. Whoa. Whoa. This tastes just like cherry pie. Just like cherry pie. That is interesting. It's not Belgian and it's not red. I like it. I definitely like it. I like it, but it's almost too sweet and too sour all at the same time. That is just weird. The warmer it gets, the sicklier, sweeter it is. Whew. It's still very, very tart on the backside. It's transformed from like sour to tart, um, but super sweet. Not syrupy, but well, maybe a little syrupy. I don't know. I feel this is one of those beers that's very unique, but would be best enjoyed in about four ounce quantities. Four ounces of that is definitely enough. I can tell you that because I've had six. It's literally too sweet and too sour at the same exact time. And I really don't know what to do with that information.